Cognitive Toolbox Tool, Continuous Learning Number 13, or what we might call Lifelong Learning. So what's continuous learning? Continuous learning refers to the ability to continue, develop and improve one's skills, knowledge in order to perform effectively and adapt to changes in the workplace. So quite often you're doing this and you don't realise you're doing it. Continuous learning on a personal level is about the constant expansion of skills and skill sets through learning and increasing knowledge. As life changes, the need to adapt both professionally and personally is as real as the changes themselves. As I quite often say, the only constant is constant change. Continuous learning, there are four basics. Reading, writing, speaking and listening. These are the four foundational skills of learning. All our learning is based on reading, writing, speaking and listening. Learning is a continuous process in education. There's no real beginning, there's no real end. In the process of learning, one picks up from what others know and sometimes one learns from one's own experience. Many times success in life comes through learning new skills, new knowledge, new capabilities and even new attitudes and I think this continuous learning is all about a attitude of continuous learning. So a lifelong learner is the ongoing voluntarily and self-motivated pursuit of knowledge for either personal or professional reasons and for most of us in the world of electro technology it's for professional reasons. That's what continuous lifelong learning is all about. As I've mentioned in previous slides, I've been doing this for 40 plus years and there is something new to learn in the world of technology every day and I am still learning. So lifelong learning, a bit of a skills list. So I've built this kind of list about the areas in which we continuously learn. Creativity. It's no surprise that creativity factors into the list and it's the top of my list because I've made that imagination skill the centre of the cognitive tools toolbox and creativity is a strong part of imagination. We've got problem solving and we've already looked at this, a cognitive tool around problem solving. As far as beneficial lifelong learning skills go, this is probably one of the most important, whether it's solving a technical problem, a mathematical problem, a logistical problem, or a physical problem. Problem solving is a big part of what we do in electro technology. There are critical thinking skills, how to solve a particular problem, how to get at a particular problem, how to unpack something and repack it. These are all critical thinking skills. You've got to be able to be a leader, and I'll speak more about this in a moment, but you've got to be able to lead yourself before you can lead others. Being able to communicate and communicate well is a strong aspect to lifelong learning. Collaboration. I can't produce these videos. I can't do what I do in electro technology unless I collaborate with other teachers, with other students. There's lots of ways in which we work together, we collaborate. Then there's information and that self-management. There's a lot of information. These days with the advent of the internet and all of those kinds of things, information overload is the norm. So how can we go about managing that information? And then finally, being adaptable. Being able to take the skill that you've learned in one place and apply it in another. So adaptability is a strong part. So creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, leadership, communication, collaboration, information management and adaptability are the big skills within lifelong learning. So let's start with creativity. 
And again, as I say, it's no surprise that this one is at the top of my list. At the risk of overdriving the point in electrical physics, we must have a degree of imagination and creativity to develop mental models that will assist us with the complexity and abstractiveness of the physics. So we can't see it, hear it, touch it, taste it or smell it. So we're going to have to find creative secondary tertiary ways to deal with electrical physics. So quite often one of the secondary ways we do that is we use things called multimeters, voltmeters, ammeters, frequency meters to tell us what's going on in a circuit. So we've got to find creative ways to do that. This cognitive toolbox has as its central tenet that I've mentioned before of imagination. Without this, the learning of electric physics will boil down to just memorization. And let me tell you, you cannot learn this with just pure memorization. And only a very few are ever very good at even that. Even at that point, those who can memorize can seldom apply what they know. So it's not just a matter of being able to know it and remember it in this, that sense, but be able to remember it, rework it, and apply it to different situations and contexts. That is what is required. We can only learn something when we can make sense of it, when it has some meaning. Electrical physics is complex, dense, and remote to our senses, making it very difficult to make sense of what's going on. So only imagination and creativity can give us the tools to handle the density and the complexity of this physic. Problem solving, as far as beneficial to lifelong learning skills go, this one is very, very important after imagination. But cognitive tool number 12 is all about problem solving. So I won't go through it all again here, but there's the seven steps of problem solving that I'll remind you of. So I'll remind you that problem solving in electrical is a double or a parallel issue often. Firstly, the physics itself, and then the mathematics that we use to represent it. You need to solve both in tandem or in parallel. That is to use electrical parlance. So both work in tandem, together at the same time or in parallel, both the physics and the maths. The physics is most important, the maths is secondary. That's an important aspect to remember, that the maths is just a modelling system representing what the physics is doing. Critical thinking. Critical thinking is thinking in a disciplined way to process actively and skillfully conceptualising, applying, analysing, synthesising and evaluating the information gathered from either an observation, an experience, something you're reflecting and thinking back upon, reasoning or maybe even something that's been communicated to you as a guide to a belief and action. So critical thinking is about being able to apply, analyze, take the information that we might gather around an electrical circuit by measuring voltage and current, synthesizing and analyzing that into a conceptual model, and then being able to apply it to action it in some way. In electrical physics, we can't do any direct observation. So we must improve our critical thinking skills in being able to conceptualize and synthesize and evaluate through reflection, or looking at the measurements that voltmeters and current meters and frequency meters and watt meters, all kinds of things that measure information around a circuit for us, be able to take all that on board and then build a conceptual model synthesize it and analyze it. This is difficult stuff for everyone, but it is forced on us by the very nature of our electrical physics. So these 
um, abilities are best improved through playing strategy games. I've mentioned this before, that require thinking skills. Games like chess, risk, mastermind, and one of my favourites, Scotland Yard, really tease out and help you with your critical thinking skills. So again, play those kinds of games and play them often. Leadership. So the big thing here is self-leadership. Self-leadership is having a developed sense of who you are, what you can do, where you're going, coupled with the ability to influence your communication, your emotions, your behavior, and the way you're going to get there. So we're talking about the whole person here, not just your ability to think, but your ability to be able to see and understand and reflect upon who you are. Your ability as an electrician might be quite low at the moment as an apprentice. It might be quite high as an adult learner so or a mature age learner. So being able to influence your communications, how your emotions and behaviours work, all of these things you've got to be able to self-lead. Self-leadership is the ability to reflect, manage on your own emotions and motivations. In this case, it relates to the learning or lifelong learning, learning all your life. So can you lead yourself through learning the rest of your life? Self-leadership is as much an, about an attitude as it is about anything else. And I think I mentioned this in the previous slide. Self-leadership is about having an attitude of taking responsibility for your own learning. I think I mentioned this also in metacognition, being responsible for your own learning. That's what leadership is. So leadership or self-leadership is about your attitude to yourself and how you manage your learning yourself. An example of this is, while others are leading you away, can you lead yourself and the others back? It's first having the ability to know that you are being led and that you are maybe being led away. It can be being led well. It can be being led poorly. But are you being led, particularly in your tech classes? Are you letting your mates lead you away from the predominant thing that you need to be learning at that point in time? And if so, can you detect that that's happening? And can you have the leadership skills to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to be led away. I'm going to be led myself. I'm going to lead myself into doing this learning and doing it well. Communication. When communication is effective, both the student and the teacher will benefit. Communication makes learning easier, helps students to achieve their goals, increases opportunities for expanded le learning, strengthens the connection between the student and the teacher, and creates an overall positive learning experience. You've got to remember that education is communication and it is relational. You learn in relation to something or someone and through something else. Now, I've got a little diagram over here on the right-hand side that may look a bit strange to you. And it comes from my PhD. And I've got my uh, cursor under the word subject because that's you. The subject is you. And you're going to go through some activities. Those activities may involve emotion, cognition, and they're going to be built in a social context. So as you move through your activities, you're going to be learning about some kind of object. That object might be the theory that sits behind DC physics. It might be the theory that sits behind WHS. It might be learning about how to use a drill bit and how to sharpen a drill bit, and the best places to use particular kinds of drill bits. That might be the object, object of your learning. And the outcome out here is making 
sense. So you, the subject, have got to go through this process of learning a particular object, making sense and meaning out of it, and the outcome is learning. And the things that are going to impact you along the way are emotion, cognition, society. Quite often there's a thing called a mediating artifact. So we use lots of these in electrotechnology, and I've just been mentioning a few. A thing like a multimeter, and we've got it selected to volts to measure voltage drops around a circuit. The multimeter is a mediated artifact. So instead of you, the subject, jumping straight into what the object is that you're learning about, maybe voltage, you're actually going up via a mediated artifact, down and learning about DC and voltage drops, and then making sense. The bigger triangle, the big blue one, there are certain rules that we need to know and understand about learning, for example, DC. We quite often learn about DC in a community, and as we do that, we often divide up the labour. We actually help each other in the learning of community, and we divide up the labour. So this triangle of triangles inside triangles is an attempt by me to represent how the learning process works through communication. Again, you, the subject, need to work through activities, often through a mediated artefact, an object that you have to learn and make sense and meaning of to produce a particular outcome. Collaboration. So collaboration takes place when members of an inclusive learning community work together as equals to assist students to succeed in making meaning. How to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and that's kind of what my little graphic over here represents. We all have different parts of the puzzle, and we often have to help each other to put that together to make meaning and therefore learning. So collaboration is working as equals. That is, everyone is putting in time, effort, skill, resources, so that everybody is learning and getting benefit from that learning. This requires sensitivity to others as the underpinning requirement. So I've got to think about, I'm working with Bill. What's his skill area? What's he good at that he can help me? And what am I good at where I can help him? So in helping others, you are, in a sense, also helping yourself. So in electrical physics, this is more applicable than most other learning contexts because the subject matter is very difficult and it's going to require everyone to support everybody else as we work through it and grasp the very difficult concepts. So next one's management. Management in this context is management of time and information. So time is a finite resource and inherently difficult to manage. Clear idea of what it is to be achieved, a dynamic task list, prioritise things, minimise abstractions, sorry, minimise distractions, stop stuffing around, don't multitask, because most of us can't, and review what we're going to do each day. That's how we can manage our time. If you don't have a clear idea of what's to be achieved, you won't be able to make a nice dynamic list. Then prioritise the list, find ways to minimise those distractions, don't stuff around and procrastinate, don't try and multitask, just do one thing off the list, one after the other. The next is information is difficult to manage because of the sheer volume. So discrimination is a skill that is required. One, make sure the topic is relevant. Two, think about the must know, then the should know, then what's nice to know. This is a beautiful little educational trick. As you're reading through things and trying to understand, ask yourself, is this something I must know? If it is, work hard at it. If it's something you should know, 
then you don't have to work quite as hard at it. And if it's just nice to know, then maybe you put some effort in if you have the extra time. So this is a systemic way to track and relate information. I use a notebook divided into study units and then use colors to relate things together. So when I'm studying, I have a notebook and I have a certain section for each of the areas that I'm studying. And then as I make notes and highlight things, I use colors to represent things that are must knows I do in hot pink, should knows I do in yellow, and just nice to knows I do in green, as an example. Adaptability. Adaptability is the ability to change or to be changed to fit a changed circumstance. It's a bit like flexibility. Capacity to be, to be bent, usually without breaking. So there are four ways to be more adaptable. Refine your motivation. Adaptability begins with a willingness to be adaptable. A mindset that's open and ready to accept and therefore overcome that uncertainty at any time. Two, observe what is happening and what is required. See if you can find multiple solutions. Quite often in electrical physics, there are often two and sometimes three ways to get the answer to a particular problem. Then develop a course of action. What has to be learned and how we might go about learning it within the context of what it is that needs to be learned. And then fourth, set small goals. One of my favorite sayings, or well, my PhD supervisor taught me this, how do you eat an elephant? It's quite easy, one mouth full at a time. So don't try and do everything in one hit. Set small goals, do small goals often, and you will achieve the bigger goal pretty quickly. So what are our take homes for continuous learning? So let's summarize. One. Creativity and imagination are key. You've got to have some creativity and some imagination and skills to be able to build the mental models to be able to do with the abstractions of electrical physics. Practice problem solving of all types. Three, abstractive critical thinking can be improved through strategy games. There you go, I'm giving you permission to go and play games, but make sure they're strategy games. Think about actively managing yourself, number four. Right, particularly managing your time. Be an active communicator. Ask questions that challenge yourself and what you're learning. Take advantage of others' skills and work with them. Team up with the smart people in your class. Find people at work that can help you. Manage time as it is a fixed commodity. 24 hours a day, that's all there is. So learn to manage your time in small chunks. Be adaptable in the how and where and what you're going to learn. Learning happens in all kinds of funny, strange places. One of my favorite places is the uh, doctor's surgery. I always take a pho phone and I always have a book. So I can sit and learn and do things while I'm waiting. Take advantage and be adaptable. Nine, learning never stops. So be careful where you put your effort. Learning never stops. Whether you're listening to this slideshow or you're going to be doing something else, effectively learning never stops. So make sure you're putting your effort in where it's going to count to help you. So I hope you've enjoyed our nine items of going about continuous learning for the entirety of your life.